I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable. And it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. These days, we're all investors. Trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Stansberry Radio Network. This is James Altucher with the James Altucher Show, and I'm here with one of my favorite guests, Ramit Sethi. Ramit, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, Ramit, I just want to introduce you to the audience. You're the New York Times bestselling author of the book, I Will Teach You to Be Rich. And you basically do nonstop courses, blogs, emails, programs, seminars to essentially, I feel, help people. Like the, the kind of material you do, every post, every piece of content I read from you is really like from the heart helping people where they need it, like how to make more money, how to come up with ideas, how to not settle for things in life, how to avoid the jerks in your life, you know, how to ask for a raise, all, all of these different habits and ways that we kind of keep ourselves in our comfort zone, you try to help us break free from. Would you say that's an accurate description? I think that's great. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. You could, uh, you could, you could take it. It's not trademarked or anything. You can use that in your next marketing campaign. I'm recording this right now. I'm going to introduce myself using this. <laughs> That's excellent. So let's start off from the beginning. Like I will teach you to be rich. You wrote that like in 2003 or 2004. You were like a little baby then. Like what was what was going on in your life that you wrote this book? Well, I started actually teaching a class informally in college, and the reason I know anything about money at all or about psychology was that my parents, who are immigrants from India, they told everyone in our family, you want to go to college? Great, you have to find a way to pay for it. And so I'm a bit of a nutcase. I built a system to apply to about 65 or 70 scholarships. And what, I, what, what does that mean you built a system? Like, was it like a software system or you <laughs> hired somebody? What did you do? No, it was much simpler than that. It was... What I discovered was these scholarship applications pretty much have the same five or seven essay prompts. So they'll say something like, if you could have dinner with anyone dead or alive, who would it be? And so what I did was I wrote five really great essays. And I spent a lot of time testing it with people, reading it out loud to see how it sounded, just making them great. And after that, I could basically copy and paste different paragraphs from one to the other by the end, I was creating about an application an hour. And it, it turned out great because I ended up paying for my undergrad and grad school. 
But the reason I uh, how how did you do that? Like, what specific things uh, did you win or or you know earn to do that? Well, I earned hundreds of thousands of dollars in scholarship money. But the interesting part about that is it wasn't just about writing. See, eventually you get called in for an interview. And I wasn't very good at interviewing. I was awkward. I didn't smile. I didn't even have a suit coat, so I had to borrow some guy's suit. is like 10 sizes too big. And I kept getting the interviews because I could write, but I kept losing once I got to the interview. And I looked around, and I thought I was so smooth. And I started looking around and saying, why do they keep winning and I keep losing? And so I finally ended up asking my parents if they would videotape me. And this was when something very shocking happened. In my head, I was this really smooth, debonair guy. But when I watched myself on camera, I was awful. You know, totally awkward, didn't smile, made everyone around me uncomfortable. And so that was when I learned little things like you, smiling actually matters. And well, well, actually, Rumi, I want to say the first thing you learned was that uh, analyzing your mistakes is the most valuable thing. So, so videotaping yourself and really breaking down and analyzing what could be potential mistakes, that's the fastest way to learn. Huge and very uncomfortable because we'd rather go through life doing the same thing we always do, even if we don't get results. This is why you see people who run on the treadmill for two years, they look exactly the same, but they won't change up their workout because they would rather do the same thing and fail than try something new and potentially fail. It's a very you, odd curiosity of human behavior. And, and you look at any sport, any profession, any game, like take tennis, take football, Though, like take tennis as an example or golf, the coaches will videotape you and then frame by frame analyze for you what you're doing wrong. And that's how that's that's how people break away from the pack. It's by analyzing frame by frame your your these critical moments of your life for you. So for you, you were having a critical moment, which is how do I overcome? How do I not be the average guy in an interview? Yep. And so you had to analyze it almost frame by frame. Yep. And, uh, and I agree. And that's what I did. And it's funny because when you do this the first time, it feels really weird. But the way I think about it is it's weird to just keep doing the same thing and getting the same results for the rest of your life. Yeah, that's well, it wasn't. Didn't Einstein say the definition of insanity is, uh, uh, you know, expecting, uh, I don't know, doing the same thing that caused you a bad result and getting it, expecting a different result. Exactly. So, someone said that. Exactly. Like that. Yeah. Someone said something <laughs> like that. <laughs> yep. So, so I ended up um, getting these scholarships. And like any 17-year-old kid, I took my first scholarship check and I invested it in the stock market. Because back then, that was, you know, it was 99, 2000. It was really hot. Everyone was doing it. And I promptly lost half my money. I didn't know what I was doing. So I said to myself, I better learn how this money thing works. And I started reading everything there was to read about personal finance. Oh, my so, God. I feel like... I feel like you're taking the words from my interview with you and using them. These are like the word, exact words I said to you <laughs> like three years ago. Well, uh, I, that's true. For everyone uh, listening, uh, I did interview you on a, a brain trust interview, and it was one of our best. It was amazing. Well, thank you. Um, you know what I learned? You remember that book, The Emperor Has No Clothes? Is this what you're saying you learned from yeah. the interview no, no. with me? <laughs> no, no. It's not about you. I'm saying I learned this about personal finance. I, I was reading all these tips, you know, people saying like, uh, keep a budget, stop spending money on lattes. And every, virtually every expert says these things. And I started watching my friends and listening to how real people act. And no one actually follows that. And so I'm sitting here with an eye-opening aha moment where I'm like, wait a minute. All these experts keep saying the same thing, but it doesn't actually work. And that's when I realized this was something I wanted to dive into much deeper, the psychology part of it. Okay, so, so let me just try to understand. So everybody knows that they can buy Dunkin' Donuts coffee for a dollar or they can buy a Starbucks cappuccino for $5. And they know that, they can, that over the course of a year, they'll save $1,200 extra, dollars, which is like $1,800 before taxes. But they still don't do it, even though they need that $1,800. Um. Technically, yes, but my point is that doesn't matter. So this, all the experts will tell you this stuff. It's almost like it's gospel. They'll say, stop spending money on lattes. Make your coffee at home. You know, there's two things to know about that. Number one, you're not really saving that much money 
$3 a day, it's not, it doesn't add up to that much compared to the other things you can do. And number two, it doesn't really work. Look at anyone right. who tries to de deprive themselves, they inevitably yo-yo back. So I wanted to apply psychology to our lives and I live in the world of what is instead of what could be. I was just sick and tired of these guys telling us what we should do instead of what actually works. Okay, so, so what's interesting to me there is you said people who deprive them of themselves inevitably yo-yo back. Is this because ultimately we tap our reserves of willpower? Like we only have so much willpower and if we're straining every day to buy, you know, some crappy coffee instead of Starbucks, we're eventually going to run out of willpower and we'll snap back. That's, that's one of the primary reasons, yeah. No, and also, no one wants to wake up in the morning, you're caffeine deprived, it's your one small joy on your commute to work, and you're gonna stop it for what, some goal 30 years in the future? If you knew anything about psychology, you would know that that is a futile goal. So it's very surprising. People like to think we're in control of our behavior, but one of the things that I recognized early on from the world of psychology was we are fundamentally cognitive misers. We have limited attention, limited willpower. Let's focus on the five or 10 big things in life instead of worrying about the 50 small things that don't really matter. I totally agree with that. And I also think the other thing to focus on is to build up the reserves of willpower through healthy living in various ways. Like for instance, if you hate your job and are stressed out about your boss, you're gonna have less willpower than the guy who loves his job or loves what he does for a living because he's just got more freedom and energy in his life. I agree. I totally agree. And so like building the crafting the kind of life you want and spending that attention and willpower on the things you love, whether it's work, whether it's family, whatever, and being present versus always worrying about all the things you're not supposed to do. That's no way to live. So, OK, so let's let's make it a concrete. Like what's some of the first things? What's kind of the intro to Ramit's plan here? Like what what should I be doing to um better my life and increase my willpower and so on. All right, so the first thing that I talk about is just understanding that part of a rich life is money, but it's only a small part. So I talked about personal finance years and years ago, but since then I moved on to many other things. And I think it's important to know that for me, a rich life is about saying yes. For a lot of my readers, it's yes, I wanna go out on Friday night. Yes, I wanna take a trip to Vegas. Yes, I wanna buy a round of drinks or a vacation for my parents. What I do on a really tactical level is to automate as many things as I can. So when I wake up in the morning, my money goes where it needs to go. Um, I have a calendar set with everything I need to be doing for the day. I'm not wasting willpower looking for my keys or wondering what to wear. It's already automated. And that is one of the chief ways that I talk about getting the things done so you can live a rich life. And so, so, uh, it seems like would that take away any of the diversity in life or spontaneity in life? Well, I actually think it's the opposite. I think that when you automate the basics, then you can actually be more spontaneous. So, for example, I know that, um, like, the, if I, I know that I'm going to the gym, for example, on these certain days, which means that once that's done, I don't have to worry about when am I going. At the end of the day, it's totally free for me to do whatever I want. And when I do it, I'm 100% present. So I love that you identified that, that idea, that barrier, that if I plan everything out, my life is not going to be spontaneous. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm saying is if you automate your money, for example, and I show how to do this in my book and I can talk about it now if you want, all the money goes to your savings, your investing, etc. By the time it comes to you and your checking account, that's guilt-free. So if you want to spend... 500 bucks on a pair of shoes, be my guest, please. If you want to get an expensive apartment or buy a gift for someone, do it. You don't have to feel guilty because all the other basics in your life are handled. I, I, I agree with this. Like, I will tell you, the I've gone up and down. My listeners know my story already. But the main way I've always lost money is not by spending an extra $100 on a TV or a computer or whatever. The only way I've gone broke is by making enormous bad investment decisions or mm -hmm. buying homes. So <laughs> it's 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 very hard to actually like go totally broke. And I've ha been up and down, had jobs, started businesses. I've done the whole thing. It's s saving on that Starbucks won't make you be rich, and it won't make you 
go broke. Yeah, exactly. And by the way, the, the house thing is a great example because you and I both agree on the housing uh, issue. And I think that it's one of the great lies told to us. Um, and I wonder if we can just talk about great lies that are told to us for a minute. Yeah. The, so so the, ho- the housing thing, everyone says you should, just like everyone says you should keep a budget and keep a latte. Everyone says buying real estate is the best investment you can make. And, and everyone takes it almost as gospel, as religion. But if you were to actually run the numbers, you would realize a lot of it is BS. Uh, in fact, you have to add basically 50% on to the price of your mortgage to account for all these invisible phantom costs, which nobody talks about. Well, so, well you know, just to mention, so real estate itself, okay, over the past 100 years has returned just 0.1% exactly. a year. And then if you add in property taxes and maintenance, you're, you're, you're cooked. So people say, well, you're flushing your rent down the toilet, but you could put your rent in investments that do better. Yeah. And so it's amazing because when you say this to people, it's like you're attacking their religion or their parents. I mean, they are totally unprepared and unwilling to hear it. But, you know, I I did a very detailed teardown of the numbers. Why do you think that people are so in love with the idea of real estate? Well, I will tell you, I think there's a huge cognitive bias that they their parents made the investment, so it must be right. Then they make – it's the largest investment decision you make of your life. Mm-hmm. So once you make it, it has to be good. Like you get this cognitive bias that your brain tells you you had to have made the right decision, and then, and then it's religion. Yeah, exactly. And I told – because people are – they'll say stuff like, what, do you expect me to become a real estate expert? And I said, for the biggest purchase of your life, yes. I expect you to become intermediate to advanced at understanding – real estate and all these certain phrases, but most people, they get caught up. And then it's, it's very frustrating for me because I'll tell you, James, of the emails I get from people in financial distress, at least 40%, at least 40, probably more like 50 are in trouble because of a house they purchased. Sure. I bet you it's more like 80% actually, but I'll, I'll, I'll easily believe 50 because I think it's 80% because the emails I get is more like 80 or 90%. Everyone's yeah. about to lose their house. Yeah. And, and, and when- I, the two houses I've owned, I lost. So yeah, it's, it's unbelievable. So it's unbelievable. But I, I do think that the larger interesting point there is for everyone to think about what are the great lies that are being told and what's in it for them. So when you hear these lies, understand that it's the real estate industry, which is one of the biggest lobbyists of all. It's, um, you know, it's the, yeah, the retail stores. Yeah, a $15 trillion dollar mortgage industry. So yeah, they're I'll, not going to, they're going to, they're going to, they have a big incentive more than any other industry on the planet to get you to buy a house and to believe that religion. Exactly. So what are the other lies? Other lies are telling you, you know, you need to wait 30 years um, to retire and you need to put in your time. I mean, there's so, like other lies when it comes to jobs, you should just be lucky you have a job in this economy. And the truth is, for all of the students of mine who are top performers, the economy could be crashing. They're still getting six-figure jobs. So there's one thing I've learned is to not believe the lie. Sometimes it's other people lying to us. Sometimes it's us lying to ourselves. I totally agree. I think the lie, the societal myths, you know, on the one hand, it's what made us strong as a species. Because we're willing to, like, I believe in the same story as, say, someone in China. So I'm able to cooperate with someone, a complete stranger, 30,000 miles away or whatever. So that's that's a positive aspect of storytelling. But there's this huge negative aspect of this societal storytelling. But I want to get an example, though. You say, let's say the economy is crashing. You have students getting six-figure jobs. What's an example of that? Oh, I have a a million examples. So I had one of... I had one of my students who had just graduated from college. And, you know, college graduates, they have basically zero functional skills, all right? They're brand new to the job Negative market. Negative functional skills. <laughs> exactly. So she, she comes to me and she said, um, can you help me find a job? And I was at the time developing this course called Find Your Dream Job. And we, we do these things very extensively. We'll spend years. We collect like 100,000 data points. And by the time the public ever sees it, it is like we went through 17 versions to get this course right. So I said, all right, I'll help you get a job. And in exchange, you agree to let me take a video at each step of the way. So what most people do when they go find a job is they do everything just like everyone else. They sit at home, log onto some useless website, post their resume, and just sit back and wait. 
And <laughs> why would any hiring manager find you when there's a million other people doing the same thing? So I taught her how to identify what her dream job is. A lot of us don't know what that is. We're worried about closing doors. We're worried about making a decision and sticking in the same job for 30 years. I taught her how to test it. It's all about testing. And she also did something we called natural networking. So as we both know, James, if you just submit your resume, you're just at the mercy of the hiring manager like anyone else. But the best jobs happen through personal networks. So I taught her how to reach out to the right people, what to say in an email, how to take them out to coffee, and honestly, what to say when you get to coffee. Like, Why would a senior executive want to meet you if you're 22, 32, whatever? She ended up narrowing down her job to two dream companies. She got offers from both, and she negotiated a $10,000 raise. All this in a very tough economy. And what it goes to show you is you can do everything just like everyone else, and you should expect the exact same results. If you, okay. send out a, if you send out 100 resumes, it makes no difference. But if you do things a little differently up front, you can get way different results. So, so let's break this down because there's, there's a lot of, you, you just said a lot of incredibly valuable things. So, so A, I like how, let's look at this from a meta point of view. So you yourself were building a course on how to find your dream job. So I like how you documented the process of videotaping her. So a lot of times people build info, information products that they want to sell on the internet, but they don't always, they just write stuff down. They don't always document the process and really work with people to get you know, testimonials and case studies. This is a very strong, important thing for anybody to realize if they want to essentially make money from home selling an information product. But what, how did she identify her dream job? What was her dream job? So she first thought that she wanted to do biz dev, which is business development, which sounds cool until if you're actually in the industry, you realize that biz dev is pretty much BS until you're in your mid thirties. Biz right. dev in the early stages is just like Excel nonsense. So I, I smiled when she told me that. I said, okay, well go test it. And I taught her how to go find other biz dev professionals and ask them what the real, uh, what, what is the real life like? She ended up focusing on sales in a tech company, B2C, between 15 to 100 employees. That is a really specific way of looking at it. And instead of sending out your resume to like a million different companies, you can focus on just 10 and write amazing cover letters, amazing resumes, and even get to know those teams individually. Okay, so, so, so what did she do? So she, did, she went through the whole process and she met people at these companies and she did it really casually like hey i'd love to take you out to coffee would love to learn a little bit about your position how'd you get there this is called an informational interview but why why would they like if i did that people would say oh this i'm not responding to this guy was she like really beautiful so they all wanted to have coffee with her <laughs> listen like what's the so, real story all right so first of all some of my students are attractive and some of them are extremely unattractive it's not about how they look it's about the emails they write and what you have to understand when you're emailing people, whether it's to get a job or whether it's to say, thank you, I admire you, or even just to make a friend, it's that you have value. So when people email me, for example, if they email me a question like, what should I do with my money or how do I get a job? I'm not going to reply because I've written about it for 10 years. Go right. read my stuff. But if they say, Ramit, I really loved what you said about XYZ. I applied it. It worked. Here's what I learned. And I just wanted to say thank you. Everyone loves that. And also everyone loves to give advice if they believe that you will actually take action. So when a young person emails, whether you're in your 20s, 30s, it doesn't matter what age really. When someone emails and they're like, I'm fascinated with you, this is why I'm interested, here's what I've already done to try to answer this question, but here's where I'm stuck and I would love some advice. If you do that, people will respond and we show you the actual word for word scripts that we use in the course. That's one of the I, things we do a lot of. I like the, here's what I've done. Mm -hmm. uh, as well as the ask advice, because I think if you just ask advice, if the advice if the advice you're asking for is not well informed and shows that you haven't really done the research, then it's like you say, then uh, no one's going to reply. You didn't reply to people. But if you if you show that you if you give a little, if you show like, look, I followed your career here, here, here and here. I've done this, this and this. Now, what would you do here? Then I think that it inspires a conversation. Totally. People want to know that they're talking to someone who's actually done something, not someone who just jotted off an email hoping for a magic bullet to fall down from the sky. Right.
So, okay, so, so again, though, how is she narrowing down to her dream job? All right, so here's the big thing. Whether it's with um, your dream job or starting a company, finding an idea, it's all about testing. A lot of people believe that you're going to sit and wait to find your passion. This is another big lie that everyone tells you. Oh, right. passion is going to fall down from the sky. How many people do we know that are in their 60s? They never found their passion. Because finding your passion means you literally find it. You seize it. Um, I like to discourage my students from just waiting around and looking up to the heavens. So what she did was she made a list of certain things that she's good at, certain companies she's interested in, certain positions. And the truth is, when you're starting off, you don't know anything. And that's okay. Like when I start in a new area, I really don't know anything. And that's okay. But what I do is I try to learn about it. I do my online research. Most importantly, I go talk to people in that industry. So she did that. For example, she thought biz dev was cool. She went and talked to three or four biz dev people. She realized, this isn't what I want to do with my life. So she crossed that off the list. Most people, they don't do this. They wait for a passion to fall from the sky. The truth is, I believe, when you get good at something, you get passionate. So the first step is not to wait for your passion. It's to go test your ideas and find out what's going to get you that dream job or that business you want to start. Okay, so so she started testing in different areas. She mm -hmm. got some response. And then where did the six-figure job come in? Okay, so th remember, this, this is one of the students. She was brand new, so she didn't get a six-figure job, but she did negotiate a $10,000 raise. So she ends up narrowing it down to, like I said, sales companies, B2C tech. And I taught her how to negotiate. So I'm Indian guy. I was bred to negotiate. I taught her everything she needed to know. They tried to put the muscle on her. You know, she's young. She's inexperienced. They tried to say, you have two days. We have an exploding offer. We need to know. All these kind of typical gambits that they use. So she knew that she had done such a great job leading up to that, that she had a lot of leverage. Something that a lot of people don't realize. By the time a company likes you, especially uh, the hiring manager, you have a lot of leverage. They already spent thousands recruiting you. They don't want to lose you. So I taught her some of the words to use and how to negotiate and even pit the companies against each other. And she ended up getting offers from both. She negotiated $10,000 raise and she made the decision to go to one of the companies. What are some of, the, what are some of those key words? Like I, I know we're dipping a little into what you charge for typically, but what are, what are some of the key words people can, can use or look for in these negotiations? Well, the first thing they're going to ask you is, what is your existing salary? What's your current salary? And you don't want to answer that, okay? Uh, because the minute you answer that, you've now put yourself in a box, and they know exactly what to offer you. And the also, anchoring is a, a very strong cognitive bias. Like, you just anchored them. Exactly. So the truth is, your future salary has very little to do with your existing salary. Your future salary has to do with the value you're adding to the company. So here's the exact words I like to use. Instead of saying, uh, my current salary is 50K, or, uh, I don't want to tell you that, which is just weird, I say, you know, I'm sure we can get to the numbers if and when we both decide this is a great position for both of us. But right now, I'm just trying to see if this is a good fit, just like I'm sure you're trying to see if this is a good fit. So you, 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 know, you know, I just want to interrupt a little. My response when somebody, when I'm negotiating a salary like that, is I say, look, you do this. You guys do this all day long. I'm intent on doing a good job for you, but my job isn't to negotiate salaries. That's so you have to give me guidance on what salary uh, we should pick here. Like I basically throw it at them in a slightly different way than you just yeah. described. Yeah, I mean absolutely. So either way, whatever you're comfortable with. But the idea is, there are certain things we call them competence triggers. So a competence trigger is the sign of someone who's really good. Let me give you an example. Let's say that uh, we're talking about a guy walking into a bar, all right? And let's pretend for a guy minute. Guy walks into a bar. Sounds guy like Guy walks joke. into a bar. <laughs> exactly. And he walks in. He's kind of hunched over. He looks around very furtively. He has no friends. He just kind of, st he's staring at a group of people. And he's standing alone. And he's maybe sipping weirdly on a glass of water. You're like, this guy is really creeping me out, okay? And now it sounds like you just followed me to a bar last night. <laughs> <laughs> now, now imagine you have another guy walk in. He walks in. He takes a slow look at the room. He takes off his coat, walks over to the bartender. The bartender says, hey, how you doing? And he tells a couple jokes. He sees his friends in the corner, buys them around, goes over, and he's the life of the party. 
Just from looking at these two guys, not even hearing a word they say, who are you more impressed or attracted to? Well, of course, the, the latter guy. Of course. So that is a competence trigger. Walking in, knowing the bartender, telling a joke. The truth is, competence triggers are all around us, and you can use them. Sometimes you can act as if. So a high-value person who has five job offers, he's never going to answer the question about how much do you currently make. He'll say, you know what? Let's first figure out if this is a good fit. I'm sure we can discuss the numbers later. I and love that. When, when the hiring manager sees that, whether or not you have five job offers, they instantly slot you with all the other people because you're using the same competence trigger as truly high competence people. It's not unethical. It's not being sneaky because you're not lying and saying I have five offers. You're just acting as a person who has five other job offers would. Act as if and soon you will become. Fake it till you make it. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so she did this with two companies. Yep. And, and how did you know, how did you train her to have that appropriate swagger? Or, or was, she, was it like built in? No, no, no way. It's not built into most of my students. And it wasn't built into me except for, you know, I learned how to negotiate with like Macy's when I was a kid. Um, I sat down with her and I recorded all these things. It's all on video in a lot of my courses. And she negotiated against me. And I played the mean recruiter. I played the nice guy. I played, and every time she did it, I systematically tweaked her responses. Men and women uh, have very different ways of negotiating. Each has their own strengths and weaknesses. For example, uh, young women in particular tend to chronically over smile or use upturned questions at the end of a sentence, which is uh. crippling to their negotiation. So I why is that? Why is that crippling? I mean, it just, it's one of the lowest competence triggers you can convey. And we even see this in the research. So, so what we did was we corrected each of those things. And you can see the before and after. It's pretty amazing. And by the time she went in and negotiated, I mean, they were blown away. They're like, this person negotiates like someone 20 years with more, 20 years more experience. It's not that she's magic. It's not that she, uh, you know, had some skill that no one else had. She's just practiced just like any of us can do. So, okay, so she did a couple of things. One is she kind of listed all her interests and companies and then tried to kind of uh, dig into the middle of the company by asking people for advice, to going out to coffee for people or with people learning more. And then um, where, did she, where did she apply for the job? Like how did she kind of break through to HR? Oh, she didn't go through HR. If you go through HR, you might as well just throw your application in the trash for okay. most jobs. She first reached out to personal contacts. So a lot of us don't know someone directly at the company, but we have some way of knowing someone who knows someone there. Maybe it's through your college alumni database. Maybe it's through LinkedIn. Maybe it's just from emailing them and saying, I really admire your article in blah, blah newspaper. She did that. Remember, she's like, she, at this point, she was young. She was 21, 22. And she worked her way into having coffee. And once she asked great questions, they liked her. And they actually said, you know, when you're ready to apply, send me an email. And so they were the ones who sent her resume in for her. You know, I have to say, I've, I've met so many people where when they have gotten their dream jobs, it has worked somewhat like this. Like, this is very valuable advice. Totally. So, what, so, so you have a course on this, like how, how to find your dream job. What mm -hmm. are some books people can read about? Like, I'm really fascinated with this idea of competence triggers, like, well, is there anything you would recommend about competence triggers? You know, there's nothing uh, in the literature that I found that was really recommended. There's a couple places I would look. One is to look at your friends. So all of us have friends that are really good. For example, social skills. There's a lot of competence triggers to be found. And I, would, I was kind of socially awkward. I think we're all socially awkward to, to, to a large extent in something. And I would kind of watch my friends. You know, we all have friends who are just, they walk in a room and everyone likes them. And w one thing I learned about socially awkward people, well, there's two things. One, they're socially awkward. Two, a lot of them don't know they're socially awkward. So I was socially awkward, but at least I knew it. And what I would do is I would watch my friends who were super smooth, and I would just notice things they do. Now, if you have friends that are really smooth, I would encourage you to watch them. If you're not sure, Take a look at the Today Show or the Tonight Show. When you watch those celebrities go on there, notice the things they do, how they lean forward, how they smile, what kind of answers they give. Those people on the Tonight Show are the best of the best.
So well, what you know, can you learn from them? I, I totally agree. And there's two slogans or there's two things that makes me think. One is um, you're the average of the five people you surround yourself yep. with. So now you can have many groups of five. It's just depending on what you're focusing on. So in this case, you're focusing on these this idea of confidence or confidence triggers or whatever. So surround yourself with five people who are incredibly smooth and you'll pick up on it. The other thing is before I give a talk um, or before I do an interview like this, I'll watch like the best interviews in the world. So I'll watch like Howard Stern or um, before uh, before interviewing you just a half hour ago, I was listening to um, the podcast Opie and Anthony from 2012. They were interviewing Donald Rumsfeld and Louis C.K. So it was just mm-hmm. this completely insane, like Louis C.K. asking Donald Rumsfeld if he was if if he was a lizard or not. And but this was a a good interview for me to kind of get me into into mode here. Love it. Love it. And and it's not just surrounding yourself. It's like really paying attention to what they say. Right. So certain people like there are questions that are kind of awkward, like, oh, have you lost weight? You could interpret that in a really negative, awkward way, or you could watch how really socially skilled people handle a question like that. And each time you can learn. Doesn't mean you have to copy them, but you can learn how what they do and then apply it to your own personality. Yeah, great stuff. So, you know, anyway, moving on from there, I did the dream job stuff, helped a bunch of people get jobs. That was that made me very happy um, because we spent so much of our life there. And then and, and so you you did this as a course. What did you charge for the course? Um, the course ranges anywhere from we did a course ranging from two thousand to twelve thousand dollars. So my courses are very high end. Uh, I give away 98% of my material for free. And the premium stuff, the, why do we, why do we uh, demand such a serious investment? I'll tell you why. We spend years building these courses. These are not some $10 eBooks. I, it, my belief is people can enjoy free material all they want. In fact, I create my free material to be better than anyone else's paid stuff. But when you truly get serious about these things, like finding a dream job, starting an online business, earning money on the side, or improving your psychology. When you finally get serious, you realize, I don't want to just sort through 5 million free eBooks. I want the best. I want the thing that guarantees results. And so we spend millions of dollars creating these courses, and therefore, I know the results. In fact, for each of my courses, they already have results proven before they launch. That's all the work we do, testing and developing them for years. So that's why we do these serious large courses. And I would rather create a few courses that are life-changing than create 50 of these little eBooks, which are just, they're not my thing. That's not my style. It's not what I want to do with my life. Well, and I I have to give you a lot of credit. Like you had that first best-selling book and a lot of people would just continue writing books, but you just, and you know, the books, you hardly make it. Nobody makes any money on a book. Even a New York Times best-selling book, you're not going to make any money. So, so you really took that kind of momentum from that and became uh, uh, an info product business, a course business. Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a couple other things. So first of you, all, you must have had a lot of pressure to do another book. Oh, I still get it. I mean, my publisher, the publishers keep taking me out to these fancy lunches. I'm like, keep the lunches coming, but I'm, <laughs> I'm not ready to write another book. I'll tell you, I'll tell you some of the beautiful benefits of courses. So first of all, we created our own software so we can track people going through it. And if you join any one of my courses, you get a phone call usually within hours of joining. For some courses, we'll actually check in with you multiple times throughout the course. Uh, We have communities, we have all this stuff. So I can give you a book, and my book, it's specifically geared to get you to take action. And a lot of books are great. But with courses, I can actually follow you through and make sure everything works for you. And I can afford to do that because I can test all this stuff. With a book, if I'm making 10 bucks back, or or in fact, in real terms, about a dollar a book, I can't afford to do that kind of huge multi-million dollar testing. But with a course, I can. And that's the beautiful benefit to everyone. It's win, win, win for everybody. Well, well, which brings me to like with this girl, it sounds like you were doing serious coaching with her. And in part, you were doing that because uh, this is she was going to be a strong testimonial, strong social proof so you could sell the course. But what do you do with the people who don't have you videotaping them and analyzing frame by frame what they're doing? Well, by the end, we can, the goal is for us to be able to predict virtually any possible problem or objection and roll it into the course. So I'll give you an example. 
we just rolled out a new course called Zero to Launch. This is the first course we ever did on building an online business. I've been doing online business for years and years, um, but we never taught it. And interesting, I'll tell you why. A lot of people said, can you teach us how to create an online business? And we could have made millions for the last few years. But I said no. <laughs> and I told them, I said, I can do it, but you can't. And I didn't mean it to be arrogant or condescending. I really didn't. What, what I actually said, it was out of a profound respect. I said, this is really hard. I don't want to sell you some $100 course and tell you make a million dollars in a week because it's really hard stuff. But over the years, we finally learned how to take what we did and refine it and distill it down so that we knew people could be successful. So we took people, we tested it with many, many beta students. And each test, we learned, okay, so this is a problem, or we need to fix this, or we don't need this at all in the course. And so by the time it was done, we knew it was perfect. We knew it worked. And that's the benefit, and I think this is true of anything, of doing the hard work before. So a lot of, like, for example, it can be anything from launching a course to showing up at work to even ironing a shirt. I love ironing. I'm a weirdo. Most people, they take a, they take a shirt, they just put it on the ironing board and start ironing. Most of the work should be done with your hands, getting the wrinkles out before you ever put the iron to the shirt. I did not know that. Well, listen, white people don't iron that much. Indian, <laughs> Indian people have been ironing for generations. Why this is, is that? Why we because know that. like in the heat, things get wrinkled? And, uh, <laughs> I, what's, I honestly, the, what's the story? I have no idea, but I just know that um, I'm not that good at many things, but I'm really good at ironing. Indians and, uh, too have like in India, it's like wrinkle free clothing. There's a lot of like uh, linens, you know, where you don't care yeah. as much about the wrinkles. Can we spend the next 30 minutes talking about ironing? Because I can talk <laughs> about it forever. No, no, no. <laughs> I want to learn zero to launch. Okay. So I'm, I'm at zero. What do I do first? All right. So this is the whole, the whole dream, right? You go to sleep, you're making passive income. And I have to tell you that candidly, for most people, it's BS. All right. And I say that as a guy who makes a lot of passive income. I'm not trying to dissuade anyone. In fact, I even have a course showing you how to do it. And I'm telling you, you got to be realistic. This is really hard. So I have all these screenshots on this site, zerotolaunchsystem.com. And I show people, like, here's my iPhone. I'm out on a Friday night. Take a look at all these sales that are coming in, okay? So that's the, that's the aspirational part. I think the other part that we really want to do beyond the money is we all have something inside of us that we're good at. We want to share. Could be you're great at ironing. Could be you know how to do analytics or you know how to train your dog, whatever. And in the past, we had to wait. We had to go through these Manhattan gatekeepers, book agents, uh, TV agents. But now we can go direct to the world, right? There's so many things we can teach people and we can just put it up there, find the right audience and okay. help them. And let, let's say, okay, let's say I have, um, I could uh, decrease your student loan debt. So mm -hmm. this is my product. I've researched all the laws. Uh, I have this product, and I think there's some demand for it because there's a trillion dollars in student loan debt. So what do I do next? All right, so first of all, we would have you do very, very extensive research. And this is what most people don't do. This separates a product that will make millions versus a product that will make close to nothing, maybe a couple thousand bucks. And I'll tell you right now what's going to happen with that product. So we would have you discuss who is the buyer, go deeper than you ever thought possible into knowing exactly what their hopes, fears, and dreams are. So that by the time you're doing more research and even crafting a little bit of copy, they're nodding their heads like, oh my God, that's me. And I'll tell you why that's a tough product, the one you just said. Okay. Okay, and I happen to know this because I created a product years ago on how to save money. And it was very inexpensive, it was a good product. Guess what? People who want to save money don't want to pay to do it. So ah, good point. If, you are, if you did a student loan thing, you could have the best product in the world. It will be a very, very difficult product to sell. Okay? Okay, I'm, I'm going to switch products, okay? Because right. you, just, you just talked me out of that one. Right. Uh, I want to improve my – I want to get rid of my cancer without chemotherapy. So let's say I have, a, I have 100 different ways, well-researched. I'm going to cure cancer without chemotherapy. I'm not going to be the next step there. I, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't encourage you to do it. I'm very strong on creating something that is tested and truly valuable. It's easy to make money, especially with someone who has cancer. That's not the kind of students that I teach. That's not the kind of products I want to create. Let me give you an example of something that would be incredibly powerful. Okay. All right. So let's say that you know, um, let's see here. 
Let's say that you've come up with a way to teach students, uh, to teach adults about karate. This is just one that I came up with. There's a million different ones, okay? Could be a self-defense class, could be um, abs, okay? So like, let's say, let's say losing weight. This is a, even a better example. So you used to be overweight um, and you just gave birth to two or three children and you look amazing. So your friends are always coming up to you. What do you eat, James? What's your diet? And you said, um, well, and you tried to tell them, oh, use this recipe, but they never listen. But everyone keeps asking you about it. So you decide to put together a product. And what, now where do you start? Because there's a million other weight loss products. Why would anyone buy yours? So this is where the differentiation comes in, the research. We, so there's a million other products on finding a job. Why does ours do so well? Same thing with freelancing or starting a business. Why? Why does ours do well? And I'm going to tell you just one example of what makes ours stand out and which means yours can stand out too. Uh, when we created a product called Earn 1K, this was a different one. This was for freelancing. I want to read you the headline from that sales page just so you know. So Earn 1K on the side. Finally, a proven legitimate program to identify a profitable idea and turn it into a reliable side income of $1,000 a month with just five hours a week. Now, let me deconstruct that for you to show you why this was worth millions to us, okay? Mm. So we say earn 1K on the side. We actually find that most of our students earn much more than 1K. They earn tens of thousands of dollars. Because but, I guess if it's a scalable 1K, yeah. they could just keep growing. Yeah, but if you tell someone earn 10K on the side, guess what they say? I can't do it. I, it's not for me. There's no way I could earn 10K. All right, so on the side, because in our research, we discovered that people think to earn more money, they have to quit their job and start the next Google. Not true. So we addressed that before they even consciously objected. Then we said, finally, a proven legitimate program. Why? Because when people think about earning more money, what do they think about? Uh, I don't know. Scam. That's why we said a proven legitimate program to identify a profitable idea. Because the number one barrier is... I don't have an idea. You see, so each of these things, we didn't just come up with it. We didn't just sit in our room and write it. It's all about the research. For example, if you told, um, if you were creating a, a weight loss product for men, you're going to use words like strength, abs. If you do it for women, it's going to be very different. You're not going to talk about bulking up. What are you going to talk about? Beauty. Beauty, getting lean, those kind of things. Okay. So Yes, gender matters. Yes, age matters. We have uh, students that are creating products for women who are looking for love. And they tell me, oh, my, my audience is women 23 to 50, 54. I said, there's literally nothing in common with a 23-year-old woman looking for love and a 53-year-old woman looking for love. They want different things. They use different language. You have to be utterly focused and responsive on who it is you're targeting. Okay, so, you know, let's say what's the next step then in, uh, in building the product so or, they go in, through or this. in selling the product? All right, so first of all, notice that we haven't even built a thing yet. We're just doing research, and again, a lot of people want to jump right into building. Oh, let me build this product and make a bunch of money. And I tell them, just slow down, do the research, and when you get it right, you will make a thousand times what other people make. I mean, the money will come more than you know what to do with. Focus I, on actually adding value. I like the, I like the fact that... Their initial research is just simply their friends asking them. So they know exactly, you know, what people want from their friends. Exactly. So they go from their friends, then they go beyond that to find people online and even offline who they don't know, who will tell them the honest truth. And we teach them the words to ask and all that stuff. So they find out, is this viable? A lot of ideas are not viable. Um, we have ideas, for example, I've been working on a couple of ideas for years. We still can't figure out how to make it work. So we're just waiting till we crack the code. And finally, they're like, okay, I've got a lot of people who have said, yes, they want this. They know exactly what the pain points are, so they know exactly what to build. They go out and build it, and we teach them what's the format to start with, what should they price it at, how do they name it, what website do they create. We teach them all this stuff. In fact, we just do the website effectively for them. And there's something really magical about the first time you get a sale. I have to tell you, it blows people's mind because most of us live in a world where we have a fixed income and therefore we sit around and argue about taxes 
and we just try to protect ourselves. But when you earn your first 50 bucks or 100 bucks, you realize, oh my God, if I can do that once, I can do it five times. And if I can do it five times, I can do it 20 times a month. And soon I can equal my own income. And that so, is so, a mind blowing moment. And, and so let me figure this out. So, so you, you, you help them identify the profitable idea basically. Yep. And then you actually help them make the website. Like you have a template uh, or something that they can use to make the website. And, and, and what does that website look like? They're selling their product or people accepting credit cards or what is it? How much, how far do you go? Well, we have software. So we built software that has pre-made templates and there's a whole bunch of them and you can customize it all. But I'll tell you, so it's very easy, right? We set it up and we know the best practices because we've been testing it for years and years. But we don't sell directly from our site. In fact, if you come to my site right now, you can't buy anything. And we have like these very odd things we do with our business. Like I don't allow people with credit card debt to join my flagship courses and all these things. So instead of trying to sell things and just make a quick buck, we show people how to build a relationship. We show them how to use email. Like people on my email list, they join. Some of them, they've been reading my site for six, seven, eight years. They haven't bought a thing. That's okay, because I know one day when the time is right, they will. So it's all about, instead of trying to make a quick buck, add massive value. When you do, price is a mere triviality. It doesn't matter. So, so, okay, so once they're in, though, and again, they come up with their idea, you help them create their website, which they could sell products mm -hmm. off of. Mm -hmm. uh, how do they then drive traffic to the, to the site? So we teach them this. So part of it is, you write remarkable content. This is the same way I grew my site. So we're not writing just top 10 ways to do blah, blah, blah. Because we've done all this research, we know what people's pain points are, right? Like if you're, uh, if you're teaching um, men how to dress or women how to dress, you can write content about how you wake up in the morning and you look at your closet, you're like, ugh, I don't know what to wear. That is a very powerful piece compared to six spring fashion items. And then you take those and you go to other sites with other traffic and you say, hey, I have this great piece. I'd love to share it with your audience. Would you be interested? And then eventually you can get traffic just like that. It's very but, simple. By the way, what you just said is the most powerful way to get traffic to your site. So, you know, I give this Twitter, this Q&A on Twitter every Thursday, every single week. And I've done this for three or four years every Thursday. Every single week, someone asks, how can I get traffic to my blog? And the number one answer is don't put content on your blog. First, guest blog on highly trafficked sites because that's how you just, you don't care about your little tiny piece of real estate on the internet. You mm -hmm. care about your name and your message being seen by lots of people. And so it's very important to get on like well-read sites. Exactly. Go where the traffic is. Go where the people you want to reach are. Nobody cares about your site. In fact, nobody cares about you when you're starting right. out. So, 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 and the other, the other important thing you said is tell stories. Don't just yes. stand on a pedestal and give a list because who, it's like you said, who the hell are you? You yeah. have to tell your story to introduce who you are. And it has to be some, you have to be someone people relate to someone who has a story that, you know, everyone else has gone through. Like, oh, I can't find pants to wear in the morning because I didn't iron anything. Exactly. Well, you do this best. And I think everyone listening is infatuated and obsessed with the way you tell stories total vulnerability, something that I'm learning from. And just, it's fun, it's funny, and you don't take yourself too seriously. All of us have problems. Like for me, when it was, I was starting out, it was like, all right, I don't know where my money's going. Then it was like, I don't know how to start this business or I'm socially awkward, whatever. We can all talk about that. And we all have these experiences that if you can share, people say, hey, that's what I was thinking too. Let me click and check this guy's site out oh, he's got an email newsletter where he gives away a free PDF on blah, blah, blah. Yeah, totally. They sign up, they like you, and one day when you have something to sell, they are delighted to pay. I see. So, okay, so so you, there, someone get, has the product, uh, sets up kind of a little site, but starts guest blogging on mm -hmm. highly trafficked sites, and essentially now tries to maybe collect email addresses as the first step. That's right. And then eventually upsell to the email list. That's right. They're going to, if they have a course, if and when they have one, they're going to release it. And it's the best way for selling is you're actually doing them a favor because they've been reading your free stuff. They're like, I want more. I want something else. I want a system. And when you give it to them, you're actually fulfilling their demand. So it's awesome. 
So that's great because that is the process you use for your product. Like you're all, you're basically just describing your methodology. And this, yeah, has been, I mean, this has been your methodology from the beginning. Well, that's ex so that's why we, we spent years and years perfecting the methodology before we ever wanted to teach anyone else. We wanted to know it in and, inside and out. And so, what's, what's like your most successful student right now? Oh, we have, uh, I mean, l let, me, let me give you, we, we put video interviews of all of them on zerotolaunchsystem.com. But one of my favorites is this guy named James. And he's, I think he's probably in his 40s. He's a chemistry tutor. And, you know, chemistry tutors, they don't make that much. They do fine. He ended up using some of my material to earn over $200,000. And he wanted to be able to take off a month because his son was born. So he went through Zero to Launch. He took his chemistry tutoring, which he used to do as a coaching service, and he packaged it up into an online product. All right, so all of us have something we're good at. You could be chemistry, could be whatever. So, so what, he, what was the online product? Like how to learn chemistry in six months? Or what, what, was the, what was the actual product? It was a chemistry product for people to get higher scores on their chemistry tests in college. Okay. So he compressed what they were learning in class and helped them really deeply understand these chemistry things. All right. So he ended up earning a ton of money. He was able to take a month off with his son. And what I think the key points, there's two things. First of all, this isn't just for 20-somethings. This guy's older. He's got a family. And second, you can connect with people on anything. Chemistry is not the most emotional topic. Like in one of your recent posts, you write about someone driving off a bridge. I mean, that's very emotional. Chemistry right. is not like that. But everyone can connect to the right target market. All right? You can tell stories about chemistry. You can tell stories about how you felt when the professor started talking about something and you were just left behind looking around. Am I the only one? There's a million different ways. So we have that student. We have fitness instructors. We have PR coaches. We have so many people. And I interviewed a ton of them right on that site. And uh, has anybody quit their job full time and now they're doing this business full time? Oh, yeah. A lot of them. So, in fact, I just interviewed um, one of my other students. Okay, this one is crazy. So, her name is Julia. And you know what caricature artists are? Yes. So, these are like the people you see at, at a fair and they draw a picture of you and they kind of exaggerate it. So, she is a caricature artist. She used to make $8 an hour. Normal caricature artist rate. And... She recently, uh, over the last few years, she used my material. And we did one case study on her about a year and a half ago. She had increased her earnings to $125,000 in a year. Oh, my gosh. I recently interviewed her just a couple weeks ago. We're going to be putting this video up live soon. And this year, she's on track to make over $200,000. What the heck? What is, so is she, what is she doing? So this is the beautiful thing. I love this example because... A lot of artists say, hey, that might work if you're an analytics guru, but I'm, you know, I'm a creative. It doesn't work for me. And she's as far as you can get from an analytics guru as anyone. She was an $8 an hour caricaturist. What she did was, first of all, she stopped going to these fairs where she was just a commodity. And she started focusing on places where she could charge what she was worth. Turns out she's actually really good. She drew a caricature of me. It looks great. She's, she's really good. So you have to be good. You can't just triple your price and expect anyone to pay it. Then we taught her how to refine her messaging, how to come up with packages. For example, what does a corporate person who's planning a corporate party, what do they care about? You think they care about the difference between 20 bucks or 30 bucks an hour? They, they couldn't care less. That money means nothing to them. What do they care about if you're hiring a caricature artist to show up at your executive party? Just that she's good. She's good. She better show up on time. She better have a backup plan. So they want to cover their ass. So she learned how to understand what her market wants instead of just thinking that her art itself was good enough. Because your art matters up to a point, no matter what industry you're in. But after that, all these other things matter. And so she started actually doing that. She moved up the value chain to over 100 bucks an hour. Then she got really advanced. She actually hired other artists under her. And that was when her business exploded. So we cover all this in this uh, interview I'm going to put up online. Uh, her name is Julia, the caricature artist. But these, we, we have so many stories like this. It just goes to, to show everyone that you can live a rich life, you can earn more, and there's a limit to how much you can cut, but no limit to how much you can earn. 
You know, it's interesting because right now we're living in probably a, an age of greater economic uncertainty than any time since the depression. And I'm I'm even including the financial crisis. Like there was a lot of fear during the financial crisis, but steadily since the financial crisis, people have been kind of underemployed more greater and greater to greater and greater extent. Like people have been demoted, people are unhappy at their jobs. And you know, this is why I wrote Choose Yourself is because now you kind of have to break down the gatekeepers. You have to go from the $8 an hour to building your own business and figuring out the the way through, you know, figuring out the language of business. Like here's someone who was an artist who was savvy enough, to, I because of your course, I guess, to, you know, start landing corporate gigs, hiring people and so on. And I really think everybody has to start doing things like this. Like this is going to be the, this is going to be the, the new economy of the 21st century. Yeah. I, and that's why I love the phrase you use, choose yourself, because no one else is going to do it for you. And the, the route that we normally take, that's fine. You can do that route. You can get a job. And I actually encourage people to get a great job and start something on the side. Start off slow. But no one is going to choose for you to live a rich life. No one is going to choose for you to have extraordinary experiences, to travel on a Wednesday. You know, we all see these people on their Facebook feeds. They're posting pictures from Tahiti. On a, you're like, what do these people do to be able to do this? And the answer is they chose themselves. They made right. some tough choices. They tried things without the certainty of knowing it would work. But if you try just one new thing a week, at the end of the year, you have 52 new things you tried. And most well, people have zero. It's funny you say uh, start off doing something on the side. So, you know, I my first job was at HBO and... I was doing lots of things on the side until I figured out what worked for me. Like I was trying to do a TV show on the side. I started mm -hmm. a business on the side. And ultimately, my I was a very fearful person. I didn't want to leave my job until my, jo my business on the side was enough to pay me and my employees. So it really took, it took two years of doing on the side before I jumped ship. Totally. It, it, this is the... The idea, if you look at someone from the outside and you see they have a successful business or they got a blog and a podcast and you're like, wow, there's no way I could do that. I felt exactly the same way. I would look at people and they had they would write a post and get like 100 comments. And I'm like, how do you do that? My posts got zero comments for the first six months. But the answer is sometimes you jump in anyway and you say, I will figure it out as I go. But you can analyze it all you want from the sidelines but there's nothing as powerful as actually jumping in. You will learn more from doing it than from dreaming or analyzing it for, I mean, by a factor of a million. And so, so what's, your, what's your latest course that you've launched? Zero to Launch is the latest. It's the biggest. Um, it's our most successful course. And how many, how many courses in total do you have right now? We have about 12 to 14 courses. So I'm going to totally just, just break it down. So how many employees help you manage all these courses? Well, I don't, I don't really release that, but let's say we have a, a sizable and growing team. That's great, Ramit. So uh, are you a seven-figure-plus business? We are. That's great. So, so, and essentially, you're practicing what you preach. Like, what you teach is what you've done. Exactly. And, and I have to tell you, I never wanted to be the kind of guy who wrote an ebook about writing ebooks. So that's why I intentionally wrote a book first, uh, that's why I spoke at, you know, companies, et cetera. That's why I created stuff in the areas of careers, et cetera, before ever getting near online business. I think it's important that the, you got to ask yourself, who am I listening to? So it, they're listening to your podcast. Why? What do they get out of it? Are you credible to them? Obviously you are. There's so many people. <laughs> yeah. There's so many people that we read on our blog readers or Twitter or whatever. And you kind of dig in and you're like, what has this person really done besides create a course or, or X, Y, Z? And I think that there's value in following the very best. In fact, if you follow the very best, you will learn 100 times more than following the B and C list people. So that's just something I keep in mind when I learn from other people. That's kind of like the 80-20 rule a little bit. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You're going to so get a lot of benefit from the top people. What I, what I like is the 80-20 rule times two. So... You find the 20% that creates 80% of the value, and then of that 20%, you find the 20% of them that creates 80% of that value. So you're left with, and it, this sounds all too many numbers, but 
four percent of the content out there actually has sixty four percent of the actual value out there. I love so that. I try I try to narrow it down as well. And then you do it one more. You have one percent creates about fifty percent of the value on the internet. But isn't so, it true though? I mean, the it's people totally true. the people who I have found that have really taught me massive things. I mean, I can count them on maybe two hands. I'm talking about big, big wins. And I think for all of us, if we look at the big changes in our life, there are a few key people in our life who have given us honest advice, who have always put us first, who have helped us make the right decisions. And then there's a lot of noise. There's a lot of posts that kind of, we, we read them while we're on our lunch break or on the train or whatever. And that's fine. I mean, we all need entertainment. But when it comes to making serious changes in our life, if you can follow, if you can befriend that 4%, the changes in your life can be absolutely massive. So, okay, so this, this again gets down to, uh, you know, you're the average of the five people around you. It is, I would almost say it's a challenge for the listeners. Find those 4%. Find the people that you can really spend some time with to learn from. Like there's another saying, you know, if you're in a room, stand next to the smartest person in the room. So mm -hmm. I saw this example used in the case of Harold Ramis, the actor, director. Who would he stand next to? Bill Murray. And of course, they created Ghostbusters and Stripes and many other movies. So, um, you know, it's it's all of this is interesting advice. So what are what, you know, given that many people are not signed up for your courses at this point, of course, what are some life hacks or what are some just quick suggestions you can give to these listeners that they can put to work that would change their lives. They can see an, an actual change in their lives. All right. So a couple things. Number one, one of the biggest challenges people have is going to the gym or working out more. This is almost a universal thing. And I'll just give a quick suggestion. It has nothing to do with business. It's just about living a rich life. I had this problem. Uh, I would in, At night, I would be really motivated. And in the morning, I wouldn't go at all. And I tried to figure out why. What are the barriers in my life that are preventing me from going? And so I started testing stuff. And I finally realized my closet was in the other room. I would wake up in the morning. It was freezing cold. And I'd have to walk in my boxers to the other room and get my gym clothes. Now, it seems foolish. And I'm not really that lazy. But I just didn't want to do it. So once I finally... So you, would, you wouldn't want to wake up and go to the other room and change into gym clothes, which would take it, like three minutes. It would, it would take like one minute, but I was freezing. And so I looked at myself and I'm like, am I really that lazy? But it's not about being lazy. It's just that we try to do the minimum amount of work for most things in life. So I took the easy ride out, which is predictable, like most of us do for most things. That's just human nature. And instead I said, you know what? I really want to go to the gym. So I took my gym clothes and I folded them. I put them right near my bed. The next morning, I woke up, put my feet down. There they are, changed into them, went right to the gym. And I was measuring how often I went to the gym because I was trying different things, waking up at different times, uh, you know, all these different things. This was the one thing that worked for me. So for you, if it's, whether it's going to the gym or eating healthy, cooking for yourself, whatever it is, Instead of waiting for that magical moment where you're just going to suddenly get inspired, forget about inspiration. Test it. Come up with a system and test five different ways. Could be setting your alarm 10 minutes early. Could be going to the gym at night. Could be having a friend text you. Whatever. Well, and what, you about, what about sleeping in your gym clothes? Then you don't even have to change into them. That would be even better. Try it. It could be a little gross when you get to the gym, but who cares? <laughs> who They're cares? all gross there. I, I love it. The, the idea is don't wait for inspiration to hit test your way to it okay so what's another one well right. let's let's give a challenge oh i love it all right um i'm gonna pass along a challenge that one of my friends shared with me and actually i'll give you a new one all right you talked about being you know surrounding yourself with top performers and people who can really teach you more than you know i would challenge everyone listening to pick one person who you have admired. Maybe you've read their blog. Maybe it, it's James and you've followed his podcast. Maybe it's someone you read about in the newspaper. I would challenge each of you to send that person an email, just a thank you email that says, I really appreciate what you do. Your work moved me because X, Y, Z, and here's what I did as a result of it. You don't have to ask for anything. You just say thank you. And if you do that, you will be shocked at how many of those people reply 
and how you can build a relationship with people just based on gratitude. And I'll, I'll say two things to that. A, I used that technique uh, and it works incredibly. Like I created two completely different careers as a result of using that technique. The other thing is you can't get offended when it's a quantity game. You can't get offended if somebody doesn't respond because some people get a lot of emails, some people don't get a lot of emails. So, but, but if you do this, some will respond. Love it. What's another one? Uh, another challenge. All right, this one comes straight from Gretchen Rubin, who's a friend of ours. She challenged my students, and now I want to challenge yours. She challenged them. She said, you know, we all have these alarm clocks we set in the morning, and we wake up. A lot of us are groggy. But she said, we never set alarm clocks for ourselves at night. And she said, I want to challenge each of you for the next 14 days to get seven hours of sleep. And when she issued this challenge, I kind of shrugged. I was like, that's so easy. And later that night, I found myself in my bed playing around on my computer till 1 a.m. And I didn't get seven hours of sleep. It turned out to be surprisingly hard. But once I did, it taught me to set limits at the end of the night. And it changed so many things, waking up in the morning, being refreshed, and just realizing I have a finite amount of time in the day. I better make it count because at night I have to be asleep by this time. It was very challenging, but very rewarding. I have to say that's incredibly valuable too because you sleep for one third of your life and people ignore sleep hygiene. They just don't care about it, even though it's such a, a massive percentage of our living hours. So that's a, that is a good uh, little life hack. Uh, the alarm clock at night. I like that. Yep. And remember, you can test different things. So I had to figure out how to test it. I ended up having to leave my computer in the other room so I could finally go to sleep because otherwise I'd just keep playing on it. So you can test all different things just knowing that you will hit that goal eventually. I have confidence in you. So what's what's next for you? Like, are you just going to keep doing these these courses for the rest of your life? Or like, what do you want to do? No, I, I love doing courses. Um, we're certainly planning to expand. I think part of a rich life is personal finance. Part of a rich life is entrepreneurship, psychology, one day health and fitness, parenting, travel. So I want to, whether it's courses, whether it's a whole different way of presenting it, that is TBD. But I do want to help in all different parts of living a rich life. Well, that's great. Ramit, Sethi, uh, what's the best way people can find you? I always go to RamitSethi.com and it kind of directs me around. But you also have ZeroToLaunchSystem.com right now. What, yep. what's, what, what's your favorite place where people could reach you? They can go to IWillTeachYouToBeRich.com and they can find out everything about uh, me. They can reach me directly at Ramit at IWillTeachYouToBeRich.com as well. And I will say I sign up for your daily newsletter what I get out of your newsletter personally is you obviously have done a very good job uh, mastering copywriting skills. So learning how to uh, title something and get people to open your email and then drive their eyes through the email so they get to your message. I think you do a very good job at it. I, I encourage people to, to, at the very least, sign up for your, your free materials or whatever you have. Just to, just to study your copywriting style is very good. Uh, both Claudia and I have, have signed up for your stuff. I love it. Thank you very much, and thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming on the show, Ramit. For more from James, check out the James Altucher Show on the Stansberry Radio Network at stansberryradio.com and get yourself on the free insiders list today.
Walmart's Black and Unlimited platform is making it easier than ever to support Black-owned brands. When you go to walmart.com slash Black and Unlimited, you'll not only get to shop products from Black-owned brands, but also learn about founders like Janelle Stevens of Camille Rose, which specializes in products for naturally curly hair. Or the Allison Devon, founder of Teespressa. And there are many more awesome products that you have yet to discover. It's all easy to find with Walmart's Black and Unlimited platform. Join in on celebrating Black brands today and every day at Walmart. We are Black and Unlimited. Visit walmart.com slash Black and Unlimited to discover more. That's walmart.com slash Black and Unlimited. Limited.